welcome to the Polgar Chess University. In this lesson, our theme is the intermediate moves. One of the most commonly forgotten patterns even among the very best players in the world. Let's look at the following position. Here we go. In this position, there is material balance. However, we can tell that White's king is certainly in an awkward position, already lost the right to castle. White here made an exchange sacrifice, hoping for a pretty smothered mate, if pawn takes rook, check, and then followed by the typical elegant queen sacrifice with queen g8, followed by the smothered mate. That would be nice, wouldn't it? The problem is you always need to look out for the opponent's best choices as well, not just of your own. And as I mentioned, always look out for intermediate moves. Whenever we calculate a variation that starts with a capture or a check or an attack on a major piece like a queen, we tend to automatically assume that when we captured something, the opponent will recapture. Or if we give a check, the king will move out. Or if we attack a queen, the queen will move away from that attack, which obviously very often is the case. However, by far not at all times. There may be situations when you give a check, the opponent can block the check. Or you attack a queen and the opponent can ignore that and counterattack in some shape or form. Or like in this case, you capture something and the opponent does not recapture but counterattacks, delaying the recapturing. That's what happened here when black played a6 attacking the queen and now the sad part for white is that the queen cannot move to a square safely from where it would still protect the d5 square. White captured the pawn on b6 and black decided not even to capture back with the pawn which would create a passed pawn for white but instead give an other intermediate check with the queen. Now the white king needs to go towards g1, otherwise it will be checkmated. And here black had the pleasant choice of capturing with the queen or with the pawn. The game actually continued by pawn capturing back. And now black would be threatening to move the knight to e2 and then if king h2, queen h4 would checkmate. Therefore, white continued with g3, making some space for the king, and then black got the time to chase white's knight back, knight f3 and f4. And eventually, Vladimir Kramnik won the game with the black pieces against Morozevich, and this was played in the 2009 Tal Memorial. Let's see another game also from one of last year's super tournaments at the Chorus 2009 between Kamsky and Morozevich. Here we go. In this position, we have even material, but white has a very nice control of the center, and even though white has double pawns on the G file, it gives white space advantage, and at times even a potential to play along the H file, or help open up black's king's position with an eventual G5. At the moment, Black is attacking the pawn on d4, so white needs to respond to that. And white played knight f5. And here comes the key moment of the game. What happens after bishop captures? With the idea that if now the g-pawn takes back, 
then bishop d4, winning a pawn, as if pawn takes knight, queen takes, it is black who checkmates first. So after knight f5 and bishop takes knight, how about if the other pawn takes? Well, what changes? Black can still capture the pawn, and if now pawn takes knight on g6, queen f2 follows with queen h4 checkmate. And here comes the key moment that Kamsky foresaw when he played knight f5. And this is the little intermediate move that's so important, playing g5, opening up the queen's way to the h5 square. Now, if the black queen moves, then the bishop will remain unprotected. On the other hand, if black captures with the pawn, then white gains time again with an intermediate check. King g8, and now white has the time to safely capture the knight, because after queen f2, king h2, the h4 square is already controlled by the white queen. Of course, it was important to go with the king to h2 and not h1, when the rook on e1 would have been hanging with a check. And at this point, black doesn't have the time to capture the white rook because of the upcoming checkmate on h7. Let's go back to the beginning of this position and see what happened in the actual game after Kamsky played knight f5. Black moved the king back to g8, away from the h-file, from any potential checks on h5. For example, if we would look at the position after a simple move like bishop d7, indeed, white's g5 threat would be very, very strong, because, for example, after pawn takes, queen check, king g8, and bishop captures pawn on g5, the black queen is actually trapped. So we can certainly understand why Morozevich tried to get the king out of there. At this point, black has renewed the threat to now capture the knight on f5 and then the pawn on d4, now that the above tactic with the g5, queen h5 check is no longer present in the position. White continued by playing simply bishop e3, protecting the pawn on d4 another time. Black responded with bishop f5, and the g pawn captures back. We can feel how tremendous White's position is, especially in the middle of the board. Okay, knight e7. And now, White relocates the bishop from b3 to c2. The point is that White brought a backup piece for the f5 pawn in case when White is ready to push e5, then the pawn is protected. Black followed up with rook f to d8, creating a potential pin situation with the black rook and white queen being on the same file, especially in situations when white would advance the pawn on e5 and the d-pawn would capture there. White continued with b4 and black responded by playing c5. Pawn captures, and pawn captured back, and now we can see the pin I was talking about. The d-pawn cannot capture on c5 because of the pin, but white moved the queen out of the way, and now the dangerous pawn advance is about to happen. For example, if pawn captures on d4, then white is ready to play e5, sacrifice a second pawn. If the queen doesn't capture it, then White will be advancing with f6, and the attacks will be unstoppable. Or, if the queen indeed captures the pawn, then white is ready with the discovery, bishop f4, to win material. After queen g4, black tried his luck with rook takes pawn, bishop takes rook, queen takes, now, white already has the material advantage as well. 
came queen g3, attacking the rook, and more importantly, moving out of the pin along the fourth rank so the e pawn can advance. Came knight c6, protecting the rook, and white is ready to advance. Now, it's all a matter of time. Black has beautiful, nice, connected pass pawns on the queen side. However, white is moving ahead with an attack against the black king. So, white must play very energetically. Otherwise, the black pawns could run down real quick. Game c4, rook ad1. Finally, the last white piece is also actively participating in the attack. Queen b2 attacking the bishop, but white ignores it, is ready to continue with the attack. Now white threatens to checkmate immediately. If black pushes through only one square, white would immediately destroy black's defense in front of the king with the bishop sacrifice. The game continued with g5 instead. And now white had the time even quietly to just protect the bishop and actually threaten with the discovery of bishop h7. The queen had to move. And now, after queen h3, black resigned. As for example, if the queen retreats to f8, white would follow up with queen f5 and then checkmate through h7. A very well played game by Gata Kamsky. And uh, again, while the game was to some degree a positional, but the knight f5 move, which created that beautiful position for white, was based on tactics. And more specifically, on an intermediate move that was hidden in the variation when we saw what would have happened if the bishop captured the knight on f5 and then the bishop on d4, the pawn. Let's move on to our next example in this lesson. Here we are. Uh, this is a game from the German Bundesliga in 2009, and it was White's turn in this position. Looks like a very quiet, simple position with even material, and White having a nice bishop on the long diagonal, Black's knight being kind of in a pin, and also Black having an isolated pawn on d4. These are like the key important things about the position at the moment. The first most logical move seems to be right now to push the pawn up to a3 and attack the knight. And again, I need to remind you that it's very important to always, always look out not only for your own good moves, but of your opponents as well. Because it's really easy to miss them. We all tend to like to look for our good moves and hope the opponent will not find their best move. But nevertheless, we can only make the correct move on our side if we assume, at least we try our best, to figure out what the best response to that is. In this case, while a3 certainly is a good-looking move, it's not the best because black has some interesting tactical opportunities. It was better for white to instead try to focus on attacking the pawn on d4 by playing rook d1. The game continued after a3, black not moving the knight away to d5, in which case white would have a very pleasant endgame after the exchange of queens, the white rook entering to the 7th rank and attacking the pawn on b7. On the other hand, after a3, black has a counter pin at his disposal. Now, if white captures the knight, which is the natural move, then black plays b5 and uses the pin against the rook. White instead captured the pawn with the bishop on b7. And here comes the tricky part. White perhaps overlooked, black now playing d3. Now the knight on b4 is still hanging, but if white captures that, then black captures on e2, attacking the rook on f1, 
and after rook e1, black can move the rook down to d1. And white's problem is that after white would capture on d1 twice, first with the rook, the queen, that then the rook on c4 will be on an unprotected square. Let's go back. After d3, white's best option was to push the pawn to e4, keeping the e-file closed. On the other hand, it would be a big mistake to capture on d3, because after rook d3, the queen cannot move away with still holding on to the rook on c4. You may wonder, how can you find a move like d3? It's certainly not a very obvious looking move. Well, here is a hint. Whenever you can obtain a pawn that's really far advanced, like getting to the second rank, just one rank from the promotion square, that always gives you extra opportunities, the pawn gains tremendous strength when it is that far advanced. So look out for those type of opportunities. White here made a big mistake by retreating the bishop to f3 instead of advancing the e-pawn to e4 as we mentioned. Now white's idea is that if black captures on e2, white would capture on e2 and then capture the knight and be okay. This would be a mistake for black. After bishop f3, black can do better, and he did, played rook to d4, using that same pin again. Now white has to be careful what to do. Luckily for white, white can still move the rook to c3 from where it protects the queen. Black now captured on e2. Now if the rook moves away, then black would trade queens, follow it up with knight d3, rook e2, and the fork with the knight with knight to c1. In the game, white continued with bishop e2, queen e2, a b4, rook b4, and white ended up losing the pawn on b2. Black eventually won the game. So what's the moral of the story from the very beginning here? White has a pleasant advantage with seemingly no weaknesses, however, missed out on focusing on the tactical opportunities of his opponent after playing a3 and leaving the queen on an unprotected square. Always keep in mind that when you keep pieces on unprotected squares, it may result in tactical opportunities for the other side. Let's see our next example. Here we go. This position is very typical from the Sicilian defense when white has already castled the queen's side and black still has a choice to castle on either side, although neither side castling is quite safe as quite a good number of the black pawns on both sides have already moved. In this position, white has played e5, a very natural move, chasing the knight away. If black moves the knight to d5, white could choose between playing kind of positionally and trade knights followed by c4 or after e5, knight d5, white could choose to play more aggressively and play f5, in both cases with pretty good chances. And here to avoid that, black was planning on playing c4 counter-attacking. And here comes the elegant intermediate move that white has prepared. Bishop g6, very nice move. Now if the black knight moves to d7, for example, then the pawn on h5 is hanging. If pawn captures bishop, of course, just pawn captures knight, followed by queen e6 with a tremendous position for white. The game continued by black playing knight g4. And now that the white bishop is hanging on g6, the bishop simply retreated to e4. And now black's problem is that the knight is misplaced. Sadly for black, 
they don't have the time to capture the pawn because immediately comes rook h1 and followed by queen g4. Pawn captures, rook captures, bishop f8, and knight b5. Beautiful, beautiful combination. And at the end of the day, bishop b4. A perfect example why you should always try to castle as soon as possible. Going back to the position after bishop e4, now we understand why capturing on h2 was not working. And black played g6. And now white simply obtained a huge positional advantage by playing h3, chasing the knight back, and then simply cutting that knight out of the game with playing g4. On a higher level, this is a decisive advantage. This is how the game ended in just a short 10 more moves. Black castled, white traded bishops, and played knight e4. A beautiful position for the white knight. Now white's plan is to exchange the dark squared bishops on b4, so then white's knight can comfortably sit on the outpost on d6. Black responded by playing a5, preventing that plan. And now some other problems occurred. White played queen f3, creating a discovered attack. Black king walked, and the knight was ready to jump in. The idea now is that if bishop takes, pawn takes, rook takes, white is ready with some tactics. Again, it's possible because of the unprotected piece on h8. So after king takes bishop, queen c3 would create a fork. Black continued with rook h7, and still bishop takes a5. King captured, knight b7, king b6, and knight takes rook on d8. Now if bishop takes rook d6 check, followed by doubling the rooks on the d-file, and then if bishop moves, of course, simple pin. Instead, the game ended... With black right now playing rook h8, then white could have just played knight b7, but the game continued with g5, bishop d8, and rook d6, and black resigned. A very nice game, an amazing bishop g6 move. And finally, let's see the jewel of the week. Here we go. In this position, it seems that white's situation is pretty sad with having only pawns versus black's rook and bishop, and especially in view that if white advances right now the h-pawn, the black bishop will capture it, and then white is losing, or if white advances the d-pawn, it can be pinned. Well, both of those statements are true. However, white can still save the game. Take your time, try to figure out what the correct solution is. And here's the answer. First, we need to get rid of the d-pawn. We'll find out very soon why. If bishop takes pawn, h7, bishop takes pawn, d7, here comes the pin. And now, amazingly, king h8, threatening to promote the pawn. The only way to stop it is to capture the pawn, which results in stalemate. Very nice. Or, if after d3, black responds with king capturing the pawn, then h7, rook c7. Now it's a tricky moment, because the king has only one good move. If the king moves in front of the pawn, obviously bishop takes d3 and white is losing. If king g8, white is losing after bishop a2, which forces the king to the corner. Obviously, moving to g6 is wrong, because then bishop would capture on d3 with a check. So the only correct move is king h6, but that is sufficient. Because now, after rook c8, king g7, and black cannot make any progress other than repeat moves. Well, thank you very much for listening. Hope you enjoyed these instructive examples, had some fun, and be back next week for some more chess knowledge. Bye-bye. <laughs>